Good afternoon, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a good day. And so we welcome you from the Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition um, uh, for our monthly webinar. Um, I am Minister Kimberly Limore. Um, I am on the executive team of the CPMC. And so today we have a wonderful webinar in store for you. So um, I will introduce our guest speaker in a bit. Um, but right now, as in all things, we like to open up in prayer. So let us just get into that posture of prayer, settle ourselves down, and even take a deep breath. Inhale. And exhale all that anxiety and things you've been rushing around to get done before you got to this webinar. Good and gracious God, this morning or this afternoon or whatever time zone we're in, we want to pray for the precious women in prison, some who are mothers, daughters, sisters, grandmas, but we know that each one of them matter to you. Thank you, God, for your love remains the same and they are continuous, continuously on our, on our hearts. We pray hope will arise from their brokenness. We pray that they receive the words of Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So we pray hope will arise from their brokenness. May they see your light in the darkness and know you have good planned for them, your beautiful ones. Meet with them as we pray. We also thank you for the work of all prison chaplains. Um, during this past few years, uh, we've, they have gone well beyond what has been expected of them. Sustain and strengthen them Bless their families and may they be encouraged in their service to you. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we say amen, amen, and amen. amen. So our facilitator for today's webinar is the Reverend Sarah Job. And Reverend Sarah has served uh, for 13 years as a prison educator through Duke Divinity School and is currently the co-director of prison studies there. She has served for the last 11 years as a prison chaplain at North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women through Interfaith Prison Ministry for Women. She is currently running a nationwide study on current and former prison chaplains through Duke University her writing on theology and prisons can be found in Sojourners, Christian Century, the Journal of Political Theology, Religion, I'm sorry, the Journal of Political Theology and Religions and more. So again, this afternoon, we welcome the Reverend Sarah Job, and we just invite you to soak in all the information that she has given. And at the end, we will have time for questions and answers. Welcome, Sarah, Reverend Sarah Job. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that welcome and am really grateful to be here with you all today um, just to talk a little bit specifically about what prison chaplaincy inside of a women's prison looks like. Um, women, given whatever state you're in, normally make up between seven and 10 percent of the carceral population. Um, so sometimes when we talk about incarceration and we talk in broad terms, we're actually talking about men's incarceration because women's trends tend to get disappeared into that wider set of data. Um, and so today we want to talk about honing in on that, that women's population specifically and what prison chaplaincy looks like um, inside, inside of those walls. So I wanna start with a story um, and it's a story about my own learning curve as a prison chaplain. Um, 
I think when I started at a women's prison um, now as a chaplain almost 12 years ago, um, I didn't know that Mother's Day would be the hardest day of the year, right? So I had gotten myself all prayed up for the holidays. I thought we're coming into Thanksgiving, we're coming into Christmas. I know this is going to be hard um, and had all of my my pieces in place and my programming and special things to affirm folks. Um, I thought, yeah, that's going to be a hard time. And it was a hard time. And then, you know, we got to Easter and I thought, well, this needs to be special. This is an important liturgical holiday. Um, so we want to get some special things going, make sure people don't miss families. Um, and so we did that. It was good. It worked out. And then we got to May and, um, you know, honestly, on the outside, Mother's Day can kind of come and go. Uh, people are busy. I have my own children. I sort of expect my handwritten doodled card um, or my macaroni necklace. Um, I expect a sort of nod to Mother's Day in the pulpit. Um, but other than that, we don't really make a big deal of it in my family. And uh, so I was serving in the afternoons on um, Sundays at that time. So kind of did my usual spiel and then went over to what I understood to be my work. And we had sort of a normal um, set of choir and dance team and Christian worship planned and um, walked onto that campus and you could almost cut the tension uh, with a knife and realized I had not I had not taken into consideration who my congregation actually was, what they were actually struggling with, um, that between 60 and 80 percent of them were mothers, and that this day represented a day that actually is the truth every day of a woman's incarceration, um, but represents a day in which she's being forcibly separated from her children and family. Um, that was my first Mother's Day. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I sort of got geared up the next year, had planned all of this special programming, had gotten myself prepared, was ready. Um, but it seemed that a few people in the community had also in that same year um, had their own realizations about the fact that women's incarceration disproportionately impacts mothers and uh, that children are collateral damage of women's incarceration. And so, you know, while I had my volunteers coming in and they had devotional resources and we were going to have special snacks and cake and punch and they had a flower for each woman and we had devised a worship service that, you know, we thought would sort of balance possibilities for grief, um, real acknowledgement of what was going on the in the day, and also celebration of the ways that women mother one another inside um, and sort of celebrate women as mothers, uh, even if they're separated from their children. We have all of this planned and we've gathered uh, some of the incarcerated people who were going to serve as leaders in that service, We've got the volunteers um, in the chapel. And when I say chapel, uh, it's a double wide trailer. So chapel sounds like a very glorified term. Uh, our chapel is a double wide trailer and it's at the dead back of the prison. Um, and it's got this external barbed wire and then it has its own sort of set of barbed wire around it. Uh, so we're back there, and then all of a sudden, um, we get this announcement over the over the loudspeakers that we are going on lockdown as a campus, and everyone is to be um, kept wherever they are currently located. And at the same time, as we start to hear this booming over the loudspeakers, you can sort of hear shouting. Um, and so as we're hearing this shouting, and then we're starting to hear what sounds like banging, banging on tubs um, and maybe banging on drums. And the, the sound is growing louder and louder. We're getting more and more curious. I have about 30 incarcerated women and 20 volunteers in this double wide trailer. And we were waiting to welcome about 150 more incarcerated women. Um, and and I have no officer with me, it's just me. And here we are on the second Mother's Day. Um, and so women start, you know, pressing towards the windows and um, one of them opens the doors and 
what we see outside is a, a mass of people carrying a huge larger than life banner um, that says free the mothers. And they're sort of chanting free the mothers. Um, and they're moving right up against this barbed wire fence um, onto state property. And they've got other signs and they're signs of support and they're signs of encouragement. They're also signs um, that make it clear that they think it's that it's wrong, that it's a human rights violation for mothers to be separated from their children. And it's a violation that becomes visible on this day that we call Mother's Day. Um, but what I realized in looking out for me with a lot of compassion on this group of people, I could imagine myself in a different year of my life or a different stage of my life, actually being out there in that group, trying to raise awareness, trying to express solidarity, um, was that from the inside, what it meant was that this incredibly hard issue that was already right at the surface for all of us today um, was just being made even more in people's faces. Uh, so we start to have women crying. Um, we have one woman who falls out on the floor. Um, our volunteers have clearly not been trained for this situation. Uh, we end up in lockdown in this, um, in this way and under these conditions for over two hours. Uh, the time when we were supposed to do this program is long gone. Um, had to make all sorts of decisions internal to that about how we could still honor the day once we were taken off lockdown. Um, and I share this story simply to say two things. Um, one is that when I was asked to speak with you all about how to provide chaplaincy in a women's prison, I actually resisted uh, because what I told you all's director was that chaplaincy is chaplaincy. If you are trained in the art of active listening, if you are a practitioner of non-anxious presence and non-judgmental care, it does not matter what human being is in front of you. Those core chaplaincy practices do not change based on the human being that's sitting in front of you. Um, so I did kind of resist, um, but the truth is that women are their own population, um, that there are some of these things that do matter, that it does impact the day in and day out of a women's prison, um, that between 60 and 80% of the people there are mothers and that they're mothers in an active way, that many of them have retained custody of their school age children. And those children are actually just living with family members, not actually in the custody of other family members. So women are making um, decisions. They're actively in their children's lives, actively working with their medical needs, um, with their special education needs, um, with their basic learning needs, with who's taking care of them. Women are being very active in those decisions. Um, and that among many things does make a difference. But I also tell this story to say that um, I have seen in my time in women's prisons ways that people come at offering gender specific care um, in a way that's meant to help, but can also actually cause harm. Um, so I do, as we talk today, just wanna flag some of those things that while we are gonna talk about gender specific care, um, all gender specific care is not created equal. <laughs> and sometimes we think <clears throat> we're doing this great thing and offering women focused care um, that is actually sort of pigeonholing people into roles and categories um, that are not life-giving for them. Um, so with all of that being said, I'd like to do a few things with our time today. The first is I wanna just highlight a few trends in women's incarceration that tend to get lost when you talk about incarceration in general, because uh, we're such a minority of the carceral population. Um, and these are sites where we do differ from men's carceral trends. I wanna talk about the ways that that impacts care and the ways it doesn't impact care. Um, and then I'd like to close by just talking a little bit about how we connect all of these um, trends and professional practices to Christian faith and Christian theology, um, since this in particular is a Catholic group of chaplains. <clears throat> so a few trends that get lost um, when you talk about wider carceral trends in the United States. The first is how people get to prison. Um, 
So you may have heard before about a school to prison pipeline um, and folks getting targeted even in junior high um, and, and so in, in some studies, actually in elementary school and being able to determine sort of who is gonna end up from particular counties, especially in particular neighborhoods in prison later on um, based on what's happening in public schools. So there's a piece of that that is true for women as well, and particularly true um, for black women in particular counties, uh, black girls and teens in particular counties. Um, but there are also ways in which that story is a little bit different for women. Um, so women actually tend to come into prison later than men and tend to have completed their education. Um, women tend to come to prison Instead, um, often out of, once you sort of drill back down, situations of domestic violence or sexual assault, um, normally repeated experiences of those and often experiences of those that began early and in the home. Um, so when, what, do I, what do I mean by that? Um, depending on the study that you look at, anywhere between 70 and 98% of incarcerated women have histories of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, so what does that have to do with how they got to prison? Sometimes it's a really direct line. Um, so the ways that women fight back against um, their batterers in their own homes are normally not classified as self-defense. Um, so whereas male batterers tend to kill female partners with their hands or feet, um, there's a great book called Battered Women Who Kill, who that kind of has done a lot of the detailed sociodemographic socio details on this. Um, women do not fight back with their hands or feet, right? Um, I'm, I'm filled with weird statistics on this stuff. So <laughs> women, women who, kill their, uh, who kill their partners by having fought back um, tend to be at least 50 pounds um, smaller and anywhere from three to six inches shorter. So I often tell people, you know, I just am not gonna have a lot of success killing anyone with these hands. Um, but self-defense law is, is actually based on the idea that two equally matched human beings are kind of duking it out in a fair fight. Um, when women get the chutzpah up to fight back in violent households, they tend to do that with a weapon. And often simply procuring the weapon um, is used as a sign of intent, even if that weapon was already pre-existent in the home. Um, so there is this misconception that if you fight back against someone who has a long history of harming you, that actually that will be classified as self-defense. In most states, it is not going to be classified as self-defense. Um, so most of the women that I know who are in for taking a life um, are in for taking the life of somebody who was directly harming them. Um, so sometimes it's this very direct line, right? Sometimes it's not as direct of a line. Um, so we have done an incredible job in our culture of criminalizing most of the natural responses um, to the kind of trauma represented by sexual assault and domestic violence. So you can imagine if, um, say you were a 12 year old that started experiencing um, some sort of sexual assault or molestation in your home at an early age. Um, maybe you're too scared to mention that to anybody. Maybe you mention it to one person and they tell you surely that person would never do anything like that. You must have misunderstood the overture. Um, that's going to be enough to shut you down telling anybody anything in the future. Um, but you're still going to have this incredible rift, right? Right at the center of your identity as your identity is forming um, that you're trying to deal with in some way. So a lot of um, young women experiencing this do turn to self-medication in some way, um, some sort of use of drugs or alcohol to kind of dull and numb um, and make it through the day. Um, those are illegal, right? And they tend to be pathways to um, other drug use and activity that is also classified as illegal, whether that is um, selling those same drugs or pills and making those accessible to others. Um, so that that is sort of one pathway where self-medication trickles out and um, 
leads to, to a woman's incarceration out from behind sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, we think about drug addiction as a sort of natural or easiest addiction to talk about. Um, in my work, I find that it's just as likely that someone has gotten into a sex addiction or a um, shopping addiction, again, as a means of numbing. Um, and so when you start to talk to someone about, um, so they're in for fraud or they're in for check kiting, um, I think it's easy in the Christian imagination to somehow pin that to to greed, um, or why did you need more money, or theft, or stealing? You know, we have words that we like to uh, classify things like check kiting with or fraud. Um, but if you listen to people for long enough, uh, you often start to hear that actually what was behind that check kiting was either some sort of shopping addiction, um, didn't know what else to do to numb the pain, or even more understandably. Um, trying to feed family members, right? So a difference in the way that women end up in prisons later than men and are not targeted in the same um, racialized youth way in schools is that women often come into their incarcerations having been a big part of the earning and support potential of a whole family system. Um, and sometimes the criminal activity that they're in for was actually very easily and directly tied to trying to support that family system. Um, so pathways tend to be a little bit different, linked up with domestic violence and sexual assault, um, often linked up to other members of their household, often about providing for households. Um, and then something I also like to lift up that was a big surprise to me, um, and there's an article, I'm blanking on the author's name, but it's it's the title of it is The Criminalization of Bad Mothers. Um, but there are laws on the books in many states, including in my home state of North Carolina, that say that if um, a mother is found criminally negligent in having protected her child from a certain action that happened against the child, the mother can actually be charged with the same crime as was done against her child. The courts do not think that woman did that crime, but by law, she can be found guilty of it if she's found criminally negligent in having stopped it from happening. So what do I mean? We have women in North Carolina who are on our sex offender registry because their child was sexually violated and they were found criminally negligent in having stopped it from happening. The courts do not think that woman molested the child. The courts and the court transcripts are very clear that someone else did that, but she actually is carrying the same charge as the human being who molested her child. Um, so that is, again, just sort of another dynamic that I think we see more in women's incarceration because of the way that um, women as mothers get charged with failure to protect more than men as fathers do, frankly. Um, so that's sort of one way, pathways to prison, how women get to prison sometimes gets disappeared in the wider narratives that we tell about school to prison pipelines that are very important narratives and are the dominant narratives, um, but aren't necessarily the dominant narratives for women. Another way that I think um, uh, narratives are slightly different for women's incarceration is in the way that racial bias operates in women's incarceration versus men's incarceration. So I think very thankfully in the last um, at least 20 years, you might argue slightly more than that, um, there's been important information and building um, concern about particularly anti-Black racial bias in incarceration. And the stat that you used to hear was that um, Black men were incarcerated at eight times the rate of white men. And that has now, I think, partially because of all of this education and pushing um, and advocacy work dropped to five times for men, five times the rate. Um, so Black men are incarcerated at five times the rate as white men. Um, what that ends up looking like in North Carolina is that a little over half of incarcerated men are white but it's, it's pretty close. Um, however, for women um, nationally, black women are incarcerated at 
about one and a half times the rate as white women. Um, so what that ends up looking like in my home state um, is that right now about 70% of women incarcerated in our state are white. Um, and part of why I raise this awareness is because as a chaplain, I often get volunteers coming in who are brave enough to tell me later, um, well, where were all the black women? <laughs> Did you not let, like, did you not let black women into that program? Do black women not like that program? And I'll say, well, I mean, as I looked around the room, it seemed to me that about 25% of the women in the room were black. And that's actually um, the representative percentages in North Carolina for women's incarceration. And people are surprised about this, right? Because it's a different narrative than we tell, because the narrative that we're telling is actually about men's incarceration, even though we don't say that. And part of why I raised that too is that I think there's some very important works um, that deal with racial bias that I think are quite empowering to read inside of prison facilities with incarcerated people. Um, but if you don't know who you're bringing that book to um, and you do not couch those books and those readings with the way they might hit differently in a women's prison. Um, so if you, you know, bring a group about a, a book about anti-black racial bias to a group of poor white women um, who have experienced quite a bit of violence throughout their lives and um, are, are now incarcerated for anywhere from two to 50 years. Um, kind of not couching it doesn't set folks up well to receive these wider national trends and to locate themselves within it. Instead, it feels like you as the group leader don't actually know what's happening in that prison. Um, so for instance, there's a great book, Becoming Mrs. Burton. Um, Susan Burton writes this out of California's system in, um, and her experience of being incarcerated was in, in the 90s. Um, and she's now become just an agitator, mover, shaker, amazing force in reentry work um, and, and has a whole network. If any of you are interested in reentry work, I think Susan Burton's network of houses and the way she goes about this and the training she offers are a great resource. Um, but California in the 90s, um, the anti-Black racism in the prison systems was huge. And so if you just try to transport that, say, to women's prisons in North Carolina in 2020, um, you're going to get some rub and some appropriate pushback from incarcerated women that we don't see ourselves in this. Um, so that's another trend that is changing um, that you want to be aware of. I think another trend that is impacting women's prisons differently than it is impacting men's prisons um, is the emergence um, to the public mind and visi visibility and to the um, legal system and policies of departments of public safety of trans men and women. Um, so women's prisons don't just house women anymore um, is another dynamic of working internal to them, right? So a women's prison might house either trans men or trans women. Um, what do I mean by that? So if a women's prison is housing a trans man, um, that is someone who is assigned a female gender at birth, um, but now identifies as a man, but has gotten put in a women's prison because they're uh, state issued ID still classifies them as a woman. Um, a trans man being in a women's prison is, is actually thankfully not normally a violent scenario. And we'll get to the opposite scenario in a moment. Um, but many departments of public safety have uh, now begun, just begun to implement policies to make sure that trans men who are housed in women's facilities have appropriate accommodations. Um, sometimes those accommodations are just about the pronouns that they're called. Um, or we in women's prisons, you know, we have a we're, we have patterns of looking out at the group and saying, all right, ladies, da, 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 da. <laughs> all right, ladies, it's time to gather up, you know, and um, so we're relearning, we're relearning that as staff right now, um, that we can't make those assumptions, and that part of offering um, compassionate, non-judgmental care to the entire group before us is to dial back that gendered language, um, 
It also means that in one-on-one -on -one encounters, you're honoring the presenting identity of the person before you. Um, but another way that this impacts women's prisons is that um, transgender women, so human beings who were assigned a male gender at birth, but now identify as female, maybe they've even had some gender reassignment surgery. Um, maybe they have had top surgery, but not bottom surgery. Maybe they've had both. Maybe they've started taking hormones. Um, so really and truly, they are presenting as a woman, um, but their state issued ID still has them as their gender that it was assigned at birth, male. They haven't gone through the paperwork of changing that. Those human beings are going to be assigned to men's prisons. And unfortunately, that has actually historically been a a very dangerous scenario for those human beings. Um, so you have a human being who is presenting as a woman being housed in a male facility. And many Department of Public Safeties are now developing protocols by which that person can petition for the sake of their safety to be moved to a women's facility. So then you might have a trans woman um, housed in a women's facility. Um, for the safety of the individual. So those policies do differ state by state and then state by federal. All of those are different sets of policies. So it's going to be what prisons are doing in your state, in your area, um, is, is going to be different. And you're going to want to look into the specific policies for your place. Um, but it is one of those growing edges of what it means to provide compassionate, non-judgmental chaplaincy services inside of a women's facility. So those were kind of, I'm sure there are other trends that could be named, but those were three trends um, that I wanted to name that impact work in women's prisons that kind of disappear in the wider carceral story. So how does that impact care? Um, in some ways, it just really doesn't, right? I want to say this one more time. <laughs> the skills are the same. Uh, if you are practicing active listening, if you have that open body posture, if you are committed to creating a safe container for a person to bring the whole of who they are and to explore the whole of who they are in a non-judgmental space where you are mirroring back to them what you hear them saying, you're affirming the emotions that you hear coming up in those stories, and you're making space for healing, for growth, and for a person to thrive, I just think the gender of the human being in front of you just doesn't matter that much. Those are the same basic skills that we put into practice. Um, but it does mean you're going to have different resources on your shelves, right? Um, my shelves have become packed with resources about surviving childhood sexual assault, um, resources about forgiveness and healing, resources about um, codependent relationships, about uh, boundaries and healthy relationships, um, mothering from the inside, creative ideas for how to do that. Uh, so you are going to have different resources right on your shelves um, that you're pointing people to after that same basic care is being offered. And I think it's possible, um, I don't want to make too strong of claims about this, but in some ways, I think it impacts the way you help people process what got them to prison. Right. So somebody who's incarcerated is not, doesn't always want to process that with you as a chaplain and certainly don't don't all need to. But a big part of prison chaplaincy is processing with people what got them to prison um, so that they can move forward with their life in a way in which that's not repeated um, or in a way in which the trauma of that has been healed up and they're not carrying a bunch of residual mess with them. Um, and I will say that I have sometimes felt a real rub, even in very important movements for alternatives to incarceration, like the restorative justice movement, um, in the way that victims and offenders are talked about, um, even in restorative justice circles, there's this strong line. You're either in any given scenario a victim or an offender. And if you are an offender, you are expected to take responsibility for what you did. You're expected to listen to the stories, if not of your victim, of other victims. And it's presumed that um, 
that 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 kind of hearing um, is something that hasn't happened enough and is a step that needs to happen uh, for someone to take seriously what occurred. But my experience with the types of crimes that women commit and the way women end up in prison is that women have been embedded in systems of harm in which they are simultaneously victim and offender at many given moments in the story. These webs of harm are often inside of um, very close familial and partnership-based relationships. Um, so there is no, there's no temptation to avoid the impacts. Instead, a woman is often bow down under shame about the extremely clear impacts of her actions on the people she actually loves the most. And so part of getting out from under that, um, I think, is addressing shame as a barrier to responsibility. So sometimes we, we think we want somebody to feel shame. We want them to feel guilt, but actually guilt and shame can be a barrier to responsibility. Um, and so there's not time to talk about this here, but I'll just say I have been drawn to, to some other approaches, um, particularly a moral injury framework as just a slightly different way of thinking about um, what it means to feel forced or trapped into violating your own moral code. Um, and then what are the mechanisms by which you can get out from under the guilt and shame of that um, to responsibility and different making amends and different futures. Um, so you kind of just want to have that lens on when you're seeing even lovely, theologically rich alternative justice resources um, is just to think, does this presume a victor and offend victim and offender binary? If so, is it really the best fit um, for a women's carceral population? Um, does it presume that victims and offenders don't know each other? <laughs> or does it presume that they're each other's closest people? Um, those are the kinds of questions you wanna be asking in a women's prison. And then finally, I think um, related to that, I've come to believe that one of the most important things one can do as a chaplain in a women's prison is to empower. Um, and there are a lot of ways that we empower in our um, kind of classic ministry of presence and, and um, non-judgmental listening, non-anxious presence. Those things are naturally empowering because they center the voice and the wisdom of the person in front of you. Um, and then I think there are things we think of as classically empowering, like education, learning skills and tools um, to get the career and the life going that you want to get going. Um, so those are sort of classic empowerment. We think of advocacy and involvement in justice um, work as classically empowering. But I've also found that the creation of art is an amazing tool in the empowerment of um, incarcerated women. And so I think we just, to you all can look at this in your own time, but as examples of this, we're gonna throw in the chat um, both an album, convictionsongs.org. Um, These were songs that were written by women while they were inside. Um, and then once a core group of those women had been released after a couple of years, they were actually able to record this album together of songs that they had written inside. Um, and part of why I um, suggest that to you all is that I think sometimes prison chaplaincy work is all about the work we do behind bars, but there's at least a piece of it that's about translating that to the wider church. And this is an album I think that can help you do that translation work. All the sheet music is available. It's all free. Um, you can use these songs in worship services. And then another um, project that I just recently uh, was able to come alongside women as they created was what we're calling Stitching Stories, the Prison Awareness Quilt. And women created out of you know, they're permitted a three inch plastic crochet hook, um, created this beautiful 25 foot awareness quilt um, that tells the stories of who they are, how much time they've done, what they survived in prison and what they survived on the road to prison, um, as well as represents their children. Um, so you can kind of look at more of that, that program there, but I just come into you um, 
thinking outside of the box in terms of what can empower people um, and what makes a difference in those kind of transformations. So to close, um, I just want to say a bit, this is, this is my sort of alternative self-care spiel. Um, I'm not over self-care, but I'm, I'm over talking about it. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it doesn't offend anybody too much. But um, one of the things that I found uh, alongside the laundry list of things that always gets listed as self-care that actually helps me sustain the work over the long haul is finding um, the stories of incarceration at the very heart of the Christian faith. So even as a Christian chaplain, right, if we're a chaplain, we are providing care to people of any or no faith tradition, right? We are by nature interfaith ministers, but we are also centered and some of us ordained or licensed, um, in our own tradition. And so for me, even though I'm offering interfaith care on a daily basis to sustain myself, I need my work to be deeply grounded in the Christian tradition. And so I just want to share um, one snapshot of how I do that um, as we close. And this comes, um, I want to look for a minute just to this story and um, the story from John the story that we classically call the woman caught in the act of adultery. Um, and it reads, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all of the people came to him and he sat down and he began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, we're commanded to stone such women. What do you say? And they said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And when they kept on questioning them, he straightened up and he said to them, let anyone among you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, sir. And Jesus said, well, then neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. Um, Jen's Soaring, who's written a book called The Convict Christ, um, uses this story to suggest um, that, that we have here an example of Jesus interrupting a death penalty trial um, and Jesus kind of stopping a death penalty from moving forward. Um, another big justice um, theorist who's gotten a lot of PR these days is Brian Stevenson, and his book Just Mercy ends with this beautiful image of um, what it means to be a stone catcher and Jesus as a stone catcher here, um, that we live in a world that wants to throw stones at people, and that part of the work of chaplaincy is to catch the stones that people are throwing at others, <laughs> to intercept those stones, and um, Brian has this wise old woman in the vignette in his book kind of hold his hands and notice that they're probably tired from all of that stone catching. Um, so when we think about being a chaplain, I think we can think about in a Jen Soaring style, being an advocate or being an interrupter, a disruptor of things like the death penalty and those sorts of judgments. We can think in a Brian Stevenson way of being a stone catcher or a grace giver. Um, but all of those, of course, keep us in a position of power, right? This is Jesus, the powerful, Jesus, the protector, Jesus, the interrupter, Jesus, the stone catcher. And of course, Jesus flips that script in his story, right? Because Jesus doesn't just interrupt someone else's arrest and trial. Jesus himself becomes an arrested person, right? He is arrested. He is confined. He's put on trial. He's found guilty. Jesus is given a death sentence um, and Jesus is executed. And one of the things I love about Jesus's story as 
an arrested, tried and convicted person is that it's precisely women like this woman whose own judgment he interrupted. It's that little small group of women who stand right by him through his own carceral experience. They are brave to stand right by him as he is arrested and even as his sentence is fully carried out. And Mary Wright sees him all the way through that execution, even to after it. She's still bearing witness to his story. She's not embarrassed by his criminal record. She's not embarrassed by what the state and the courts did to him. She's willing to be seen with him. And it's because she's willing to do that um, that she's actually able to be the first person who bears witness to his release, right? We often call Jesus's release from prison the resurrection, fancy church word, uh, for the fact that there's life after prison and that there's even life after carceral death. So we worship a savior um, who does interrupt the carceral system and he does it in some of the ways that are comfortable to us as an advocate and as a stone catcher, but he also does it in some pretty radical ways that um, shake up our very assumptions of who's in prison by becoming an incarcerated person himself, an arrested, tried and executed person, and a re-entering citizen, someone who comes back after the worst the state can throw at him. Um, so I just offer that as a little nugget and vision of the type of theology that grounds my own work um, as a prison chaplain and kind of lets me come back and back and back um, insofar as I really see uh, these issues of prisons at the very heart of God's salvific work in the world. Thanks. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Reverend Sarah. Sarah. Oh my God, it was so, so very rich. A lot of information, um, a new way of thinking about women in prison. I, I think um, at least that's what I get from it. And it was uh, it's useful to those who are doing chaplaincy, whether you're doing it, like I say, in a women's ministry or women's prison or not. But just, uh, uh, I did not realize some of those statistics you mentioned. A lot of times when we talk about incarceration, incarcerated people and statistics that are given, they're really about the men. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a little difference with the women. So I, I appreciate that. Um, we have maybe just a few, not a lot, minutes for that. All, the resources that, that she gave are in the chat and, and my wingman, Jared, <laughs> is going to send that out. Um, on today, an uh, email or when they send out the um, link or the video again. Um, again, rich, rich resources here. Um, there's a question, a couple of questions there. Do you have, uh, do you have housing and career opportunities available for those transitioning from the criminal justice system as they are entering their resurrection? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I am actually what North Carolina, North Carolina calls a community funded chaplain. Um, about half the chaplains in our state are state funded employees and then half are what we call community funded. Um, and because I'm community funded, I actually do have the honor of working with an organization that um, can follow people beyond the walls in, in ways that the state isn't always able to do. Um, so Interfaith Prison Ministry for Women, um, you can, you can look more online about the wide resources that we have, um, but we do, we have landed on a wraparound services model. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a lot of talk in mm -hmm. circles about, okay, well, what comes first, housing or a job, job or housing? Um, and the truth is you just need both, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. you need a house and you need a job to make it all work. Um, and so we have uh, landed on a wraparound services model. So we do have a um, handful of reentry homes for women as they are immediately released um, that provide pretty high level support for right when someone gets out. And then that support gets sort of titrated off as a person has the chance to get their own job, to start to build up their bank account, um, and then ultimately to, to move out of the house. Um, we also have found that um, some people need stable, supportive housing um, beyond 
that nine to 12 months post-release, right? Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes that is because they've served really long sentences and the transition takes longer. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I'm sure there's people on this call, including myself, who have struggled making rent, right? We are living in a crazy economy where housing costs a lot, where food costs are up. Um, and so the vision that what success is, is to, li- to live on your own, um, mm-hmm. is just no longer a realistic vision for a lot of people. So we also now have... Um, a house that is dedicated to people who like that co-living. They need, they want a few less rules. They're ready to move on. They've got a good job, but they're not quite ready to live on their own. And then similarly, we're about to launch a house that's specifically for women pursuing their education. Um, So we all know when you're trying to get that education and you're as a student, economics are really hard, but we don't want us that to stop formerly incarcerated women from having the opportunity to achieve education. So about to launch a house specifically for women who need longer and long-term support because they're pursuing degrees. Um, so yeah, you can learn more, more about that at um, ipmforwomen.org. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question. Uh, could you speak more about the moral injury framework? Um, books, presenters, rough method, something to kind of give gives a little more research that they can, you know, dive yeah. into that a little more. Um, I hate to be the person who plugs their own work, but if you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I th- this is recently laid out in an article in um, the Journal of Political Theology um, that I wrote, and I think it's called From War to Prison. Um, rethinking crime and responsibility, something like that. Um, We can get the link for the resources that get sent out. Um, Mm -hmm. But basically a moral injury framework, um, it was developed in veterans affairs, but it suggests that no one violates their own moral code lightly. So Mm -hmm. if somebody has violated their moral code, um, that's an invitation for curiosity about figuring out why. Um, And when you dig into any given um, moral violation, which can both be interpersonal and social, what you often find is that individual decisions were made in a pressure cooker of social factors. And we litigate at the individual level, but we do not litigate in such a way that actually takes corporate and social accountability Um, for what went wrong in any given violation of law or break in the social fabric. Um, At most, something like that might be considered a mitigating factor in sentencing. Mm -hmm. Um, But in general, what we do is we find individuals guilty and responsible of crimes, and they serve time to make up for that. The system is never asked to change, right? Right how we get food to people, um, Mm -hmm. how people make it in their households, uh, how we repair harm after a violence has occurred. None of that's ever asked to change. It's not addressed by the criminal justice system. Um, We find individuals responsible. So a moral Mm -hmm. injury framework invites um, curiosity about the way that individuals' decisions get made in this wider social matrix. and invites curiosity about reparations that operate at both that individual level and that social level. Um, so it looks like Jared found, good job, Jared. Jared already found it, so it's in the chat. <laughs> um, and you can kind of see the way, if, if any of you on this call are VA chaplains, that framework will be very familiar, I'm sure. It is a, a framework that came out of Veterans Affairs, chaplaincy and social work working together with psychological services. Again, Reverend Sarah Joe, CPMC really uh, thanks you for your time and appreciates all the rich information um, that you have provided for today's webinar. Again, we just yes, love the you. fact that you have you know, shared your time and your knowledge with us. So we appreciate that. Mm-hmm. So there are a few things before we close. We have about four minutes and I need to... Uh, plug our CPMC events that are coming up. Um, The Federal Bureau of Prisons Community Reentry Network. um, That's gonna be a webinar on next Thursday, July 31st. Again, at 10 10 a.m. 
Pacific, 12 p.m. Central, and 1 p.m. Eastern time with our facilitator, Christopher Houston from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, so you might wanna join us for that. Um, there's also a foundational formation cohorts. Um, the dates are there. Um, we can also send out more information. Um, we have uh, a couple of July 18th through the September 26th. So those are doing all of that. Um, so by all means, join us for any of those. There's a cost for those. Um, usually our, 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 our sessions are free, but this is a cost related um, event. So by all means, please um, look up that information. And if you need to get more information, please email us at the CPMC uh, email. Uh, okay, on September 29th, this is a big one that we are promoting. August is gonna be a total break for the month. You know, sometimes you need a little downtime and, and, and restorative time. Plus also a lot of people are traveling and trying to get in their last minute um, um, things for the summer. So we, August is a, a down month. And then we're gonna start back up in September. And we have the C, a special event called Reclaiming Holiness, uh, Addiction, Recovery and Community. Uh, four out of five people who are incarcerated into confinement under the influence of substance or with an existing substance use disorder. So our um, special guests are four voices, uh, Jim Wahlberg, the big hustle, he's an actor, Evelyn Duhart, Ignatian Spirituality Project, Lisa Delora, just of du DuPage, um, and the host is His Eminence Cardinal Joseph Tobin from the Archdiocese of Newark. So come together to share their wisdom and stories, their road to recovery and how they accompany others impacted by this disease. So there's so much um, that we try to offer um, those in our community and those outside of our community. We would love you to take advantage of anything that we are offering because it's like I said, each month, there's so many rich resources and information that's coming out in these webinars. So um, tell your friends, invite others to join us. Like I say, in August, there is a pause month and we're gonna be on break during that. But in September, uh, be prepared to come back um, with us as we continue our programming for the fall. Again, Reverend Sarah Job, cannot thank you enough for uh, your your presentation on today. So uh, have a blessed summer, everyone. Again, we just, again, thank you for sharing your time and being with us on today and joining us. And we pray that this information has indeed um, been helpful and useful to you.